Hey everybody, Dr. White here with a discussion now of bivariate distributions of the continuous type. So again, we have a binomial, a bivariate random variable in mind, so an ordered pair of capital X comma capital Y. And the possible values are again going to be a subset of the XY plane, subset of uh, R, R2. But it's going to be like a shaded subset, not, not like a set of little discrete points, but something that you can shade in. Uh, so that's, that's a little rough, uh, but it suffices for now. So examples might be like maybe the sample space, the possible values is all of R2. X goes from minus infinity to infinity. Y can go from minus infinity to infinity. Or maybe the sample space is the set of all x, y's where x is bigger than or equal to zero and y is less than or equal to x. If you think about that for a while, it's this shaded region here where that line that you see that's graphed has equation y equals x. Or uh, how about sample space could be the set of all x, y where x is between zero and one, y isn't mentioned. That means that if you graphed it, the x coordinate of your points has to be between 0 and 1. The y coordinates could be anything because the, there was no constraint put on the y. And so you get this sort of uh, infinite up and down strip. So anyway, uh, shaded regions like that form your sample space when we're talking about these random variables. So as you might expect, when we get to the marginals, they're going to have continuous type distributions. And so that's why these are called bivariate distributions of the continuous type. So they're not going to have joint probability mass functions. They're going to have joint probability density functions. Okay. And such a density function would be a function little f of x, y on R2. And it has to have the property that it's bigger than or equal to zero. Um, for all x in the sample space, and if x is not in the sample of, uh, not x, that's a typo, it should be like x, y. So I'm going to go ahead and make that change over here, little x comma little y, okay? And similarly here should be a little x comma little y. And so what I'm trying to say here is that if your x, y is not in the sample space, it better say zip for Zippo chance. And anyway, if you integrate over the entire plane, the f of x, y, with one of these double integrals, you get a one. So I'm just gonna say right up front, you really need to know a bit about double integrals now. And so if you haven't had Calc 3, and if you didn't watch that video, at the beginning of section 3.3 on the normal distribution. Let me take you back to that. This video here on double integrals and polar integrals. Remember, you, uh, I suggest you watch the, like the first half on double integrals. Uh, you should go back and you should definitely watch that now or even re-watch it. And, and we'll take off from there in our discussion of how to compute double integrals. Um, Okay, another thing is that in the appendix for the book, appendix section D.6, there's a discussion of multivariate calculus. For now, you can ignore the part about uh, partial derivatives, just read about double integrals. That's like one page worth of stuff. So you could also look at that. But I'm also going to give you a lot of practice working with double integrals in our notes here. Okay, so back to these notes. We're going to get probabilities from the joint PDF. So remember what events are. Events are subset, subsets of the sample space. So imagine A is just some event, some subset of the sample space. And you want to know what's the probability that the ordered pair XY lands in A. Then what you're going to do is a double integral over the little shaded region A of the PDF. So really, probabilities here are volumes underneath a surface. You see, the graph z equals f of x, y, graph of a function of two variables, is some surface. 
And underneath that surface down to the XY plane is a solid. And its volume is that probability. So with one random variable, probabilities are areas underneath a density function down to the horizontal axis. In bivariate situation, probabilities are volumes underneath the surface that is the graph of the PDF down to the plane, the XY plane. Hmm. So let's do an example. It's based on uh, exercise number one in this section, but we'll just kind of take off and do all of our own favorite computations with it. So, um, grab some coffee. Let's say that we propose the following as a PDF for a bivariate random variable. F of little xy is 3 16 xy squared if x is between 0 and 2 and y is between 0 and 2. Outside of that, it's understood to be 0. So, when you see something like this, you should just start drawing pictures for yourself. So here I am drawing a picture of the x-axis, the y-axis, and that shaded square is the sample space S for this function. Now we might ask, is this really a valid PDF? Well, two things has to happen. It has to be at least zero on the sample space, and it has to have a total integral of one. So checking out the at least zero, oh, uh, no problem, because the x is between zero and two, so that's at least zero. The y squared is certainly also got to be um, non-negative because you can't have a negative for a square. And besides, y is between zero and two. Yeah, so this whole product is at least zero. We're fine there. The other thing is, though, that the integral over the entire plane, R2, has to come out to be one. So let's check that out. Well, outside of this square, the f is zero. So to get the total volume underneath this f surface, I really only have to go where the x is between zero and two and the y is between zero and two. This goes with this dx. This is saying that y gets to change from zero to two. Outer goes with outer, inner goes with inner, in a double integral. And here's the height. So, you know, if you think about it as a volume, it's like what you're doing is adding up a whole, whole lot of really skinny rectangular prisms where the base is dx along the x direction, dy along the y direction. So this little, the base has this little tiny area dx times dy, and this is the height going from the plane up to the F curve. And so that would be a little tiny volume and you're adding up all those little tiny volumes to get the total volume under F. So um, like in the, um, the video you watched and in the review they give in the appendix, you can go ahead and think about this integral right here this inner integral. And so that little definite integral is going to be a different thing for each different value of x, but it is totally an integral that you can get using the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, you know what? I'm just going to back up for a minute here. I want to give you a kind of, see if I can get, a, you, you get you a better picture of what's happening in our thinking. I'm going to go and look at a graph of this as a surface. So um, I went to the web and I actually went to Wolfram Alpha. Like if you just Google Wolfram Alpha right here, you'll come to this uh, great free uh, computational service that tries to compute math for you. And you can enter like all kinds of stuff in ordinary language and it's really smart at figuring out what you want. So I entered graph of z equals 3 over 16 times x, y to the second power for x between 0 and 2 and y between 0 and 2. And it like thought for a moment and it gave me the graph. You know, here's the positive x axis. 
here's the positive y axis. And this direction going straight up is the positive z axis. And this stuff here is the surface z equals 3 16th x y squared. And so as you can uh, expect, the bigger x and y are, the higher z is. And so it's kind of like coming up like that. And so, you know, we're trying to show that the total volume underneath that surface over that square in the xy plane is one. And the approach that I'm taking is that we slice with little slices that run for each value of x between zero and two that run along the y-axis down in the plane. And for each of those little slices, you're going to have this little cross-sectional area. And that cross-sectional area is that stuff. And then you take that cross-sectional area, you multiply by its thickness, and you've got a little volume. And here you are adding up all those little volumes for all the x's from 0 to 2. So, so we're using these, these slices that run vertically, as it were, kind of in the y direction for each x. And so we use fundamental theorem of calculus to get that inner integral. And we evaluate at the 2 and at the 0, and we subtract. And so now we got to do the integral from 0 to 2 of x over 2 dx, which again we can do with fundamental theorem of calculus. But now when we do it, there aren't any variables left. And it worked out to be 1. Yay! So this really is a probability distribution function for bivariate random variables. So um, let's just ask ourselves a probability question. How about the probability of this event? that the y turns out to be less than twice the x. The key to these types of problems is to make a picture of the event in the xy plane. So here I am drawing xy plane. Here's the x-axis. Here's the y-axis running straight up and down. That square is my sample space. And dotted in here, I drew the line y equals 2x. When you see an inequality helping to describe your event, might be good to graph the equality version. So I graphed y as 2x. And then I thought, hmm, y needs to be less than 2x. So my heights of my points, they, they have to be such that the points lie under the line. Because if you go over that line, that, then your y coordinate would be bigger than 2x. So you have to be under. You also have to be inside the sample space. And so you get this little trapezoidal type figure here. That shaded area is the event y is less than or equal to 2x. We've got to integrate the little double integral of f over that region. So here's one approach to getting that double integral. We can work with the vertical strips, just like we did in the previous problem. We fix an x and we let the y run as far as it can. We get a little cross-sectional area. We do that for each x that's possible, and we add them all together. And so, um, like, for example, if x were like down here where I'm waving my mouse, then you would have the smallest possible y is a 0. The biggest y would go up to 2x. On the other hand, if x were, like, up here, bigger than 1, the smallest possible y is a 0, and the biggest possible y is a 2. And so if you think about it that way, when you integrate f over the event, the x gets to go from 0 to 2. So the dx on the outside is going with this 0 to 2 here. The y has to go from its smallest to its biggest possible, but what's possible changes on you. The smallest possible is always 0. But the biggest possible depends on x. And furthermore, it depends on x in a kind of a nasty way. If the x is between 0 and 1, the dependence is it's got to be 2x. But if x is bigger than 1, the dependence is that it's got to be 2. 
So what do we do? To do this integral, since it's like a piecewise defined function for what the top is, we've got to break it into two different integrals. Integral from 0 to 1, integral from 0 to x. And then integral from 1 to 2, integral from 0 to 2. So we have to do two double integrals. Yeah. You can totally do it. I wouldn't take points off. I w it's just a little bit uncool. It's just a little uncool. And what cool kids want to do is see if they can find an easier way to approach the problem. So uh, let's see if there's an easier way. What if we tried like little, what if we tried breaking the volume into cross sections in the other direction? So like use little horizontal strips like this one here at some value y. So like we take an arbitrary y between zero and two and we draw the strip that goes with that y. And so you imagine a little cross section coming out of the page over that little strip. And then we're adding up all those cross sections. Now, when we do that, that little borderline here, y equals 2x, it's actually going to be better to express it as x in terms of y. So I'm solving it there, x is y over 2. You'll see why in a minute. And now, we've got to integrate over the event, f, dy dx. But this time, I'm letting the y be the thing that gets fixed, and the x varies however much it can. So the 0 to 2 refers to the y varying from 0 to 2. So I've got that on the outside now. And on the inside, I've got the area of my cross section. And for that, I've got to let my x vary from the leftmost y that it could be. So like take that leftmost point, the y coordinate of that leftmost point is where I need to start. And then the y coordinate of the rightmost point is where I need to stop, go you know, from little to big. So I, I'll call that left y and right y because those are going to be functions of y in general. All righty. So what is it? Well, the left y, sorry, the, uh, the, the leftmost x as a function of y is y over 2. The dotted line. The rightmost x as a function of y is just the constant function 2. No need to break into two intervals here because there is no change in the formula for the leftmost x and no change in the formula for the rightmost x. And so I just have one integral to do. And I approach it the usual way. Fundamental theorem of calculus on that ultimately gives me this. Fundamental theorem of calculus on this ultimately gives me some number that I don't really care about. I care about the ideas, not the number. But that'll be some number between 0 and 1 if, if I didn't make some terrible algebra mistake along the way. Because it's a probability. It's got to be between 0 and 1. Um, you know, let me give you a break. Um, I'll do uh, marginal distributions and more stuff in another screencast. See you soon. Um, if I can find where to exit. Here we go.